Uh, my name is Chris Munns. I'm a senior developer advocate from AWS, and this session here is getting started with serverless architectures, uh, CMP 211. Uh, with me is Nick Joshi, Nikki Joshi, sorry, from uh, uh, Capital One. He's director of software development. He's going to be talking a little bit later about uh, some of their experiences in building serverless applications at Capital One. So real quick, a little bit more about me. So again, I'm uh, currently the uh, currently senior developer advocate for serverless at AWS. I'm actually part of the Lambda and API Gateway team. I've been at AWS for a little over five years now um, in a couple of different roles. But before my time at AWS, I actually came from much more of a traditional sysadmin or operations background, maybe what people would call uh, a DevOps role these days. But for the last year or so, I've been really, really focused on what serverless means to us as an industry and uh, really excited and very much kind of deeply uh, interested in seeing how this is changing the way that companies are building new technology. So why are we here today? So throughout this week, if you've been here since yesterday, you've probably already heard the term serverless thrown around a number of times. If you follow social media or any industry blogs or publications that are out there for the last year or so, you've probably seen the word serverless thrown around in many different ways across all sorts of different use cases. For us here at AWS, serverless really comes down to four kind of key attributes. The first, there being absolutely no servers to provision or manage. Um, this doesn't just mean bare metal, it means bare metal, virtual machines, things like containers, anything that requires you to care, or think about, or put any sort of love or feeding into an operating system uh, is, is not something you'd ever have to do with a serverless product or serverless solution. The next is its ability to scale directly with usage. So as requests come in or invocations come in, the backend product or serverless platform should be able to scale very easily to handle those requests without experiencing really much of a delay. Third concept is never paying for idle. This is maybe one of the most transformative about the technologies that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, the general estimates in the industry are that roughly 80 plus percent of IT resources inside of a traditional enterprise are sitting idle most of the time. And so paying for that and losing the cost associated with those resources is actually fairly capital intensive for many businesses. With serverless solutions and platforms, you never have to pay for idle in terms of things like compute resources and what's sitting around that's been configured for those solutions. And then lastly, high availability and fault tolerance built in. So for those of you who have been AWS customers for some period of time now, you're familiar with our concept of regions. Inside of regions, there are things such as availability zones. With serverless solutions, you never have to think about building multi-AZ. So it's going to be something that's going to be default based on uh, the services that you're using. And so the core of this world for us is AWS Lambda, shown here in the middle of the slide. So AWS Lambda is a compute service. So similar to things like EC2 and ECS, it is a service that helps you, at the end of the day, manage your applications on, yes, at the end of the day, servers. Although with Lambda, you don't do anything to manage those servers, provision those servers, update those servers. That's all on us at AWS as the provider of this platform. When we talk about a serverless application altogether, we're talking about typically an event source that is going to be called to invoke Lambda, and then whatever the business logic is that our Lambda function is going to do. And this talk, we'll be talking about a number of use cases and aspects around serverless applications. And now serverless is a, a newer topic in general in the IT industry, but it is by no means uh, immature. So here's kind of a, a a small condensed slide of a number of our customers that have publicly talked about their serverless usage. And you'll see many different brands and companies that you're probably very deeply familiar with. So all of these companies are doing things in production with serverless architectures and applications, most likely saving money, achieving higher availability, uh, at point in time scaling, and again, very, very, very greatly reduced management overhead of managing those serverless applications. In terms of what you can do with serverless applications, there's really a number of different use cases that exist, but we typically try to bucket them down into kind of what we consider the six most common. So we have web applications, so effectively the, the API backend application for say a, a website um, or even a mobile application, and that ties into backends itself, things like microservice-based architectures. Uh, data processing, so stream analysis, batch processing, any sort of large record analysis that you might need to do. And for Lambda, this is actually one of the biggest use cases that we see for it today. Uh, companies processing billions of requests in a day, taking in that information, doing everything from near real-time analytics on it to aggregation into data warehouses um, to all sorts of things like sensor-based workloads. Uh, chatbots, so chatbots becoming an ever-increasing way for companies to communicate not just with their customers, but even internally inside of their organizations. 
Uh, you see companies that are building chatbots to help their internal teams know where to find information or who to communicate with. And chatbots, both verbal and text-based, are becoming an ever-increasing medium for how people communicate. Amazon Alexa, so for those of you who have an Alexa-capable device, when you ask Alexa to do something, uh, there's a pretty strong chance that what it's going to do or how it's going to reply to you is actually going to call a Lambda function. So the fulfillment of the conversation that you're having with Alexa uh, can be hosted basically with Lambda, and it's one of the most common ways that the close to, I think, just shy of 30,000 skills that exist today um, are powered. And then lastly, IT automation. So this is one of the uh, most basic and kind of the entryway that most people get into Lambda, especially if you're coming from a traditional IT organization or even from a development background, is using Lambda as a glue between lots of different services. And there's many different places that you can use Lambda play it, or tied into our management and development tools, into deployment tools, into monitoring and metrics tools, and all sorts of things that you can do. You can even use Lambda as a, a managed cron, as it were. So Lambda itself is a pretty unique service in terms of what it does. So again, we mentioned before how this is a compute service. Right? At the end of the day, it's helping you to manage effectively servers and your applications that sit on them, again, without you ever thinking about those servers needing to configure them in a traditional sense. Now, there's this concept of event-driven computing that is becoming really key in how people are building applications today. This is the idea that we're taking typically monolithic applications, decomposing them into event streams, that are sourced in a different way than you would think of in a traditional monolithic application. That lends itself very directly to another term, which is functions as a service. And this is where you're decomposing, again, those event-driven models into uh, directly aligned function-based applications, effectively very, very small snippets of code that correlate typically with a single event, uh, and then that code is executed in response to that event. Now, Lambda sits inside of all of these as a serverless functions as a service product. So again, it's functions as a service, it's event driven, it's completely serverless, you don't do anything to manage the resources under it. Let's talk a little bit more about Lambda. So today in Lambda, you have four different languages that are natively supported in it. Node.js, Java, Python, and C Sharp. There are actually a number of third party projects that are open source to help you support uh, any number of different languages. And we often get a lot of requests to see this list grow. And so we've got a number of days left here in the week. I'd say keep your eyes and ears open about that. You can bring your own libraries or even native ones. So if you're using something like Node.js or Python, you can bring in pip packages. You can bring in uh, NPM modules, all sorts of different things like that. Same with Java with Maven or C Sharp with NuGet. All of those are supported. Now, with Lambda, there's really basically kind of one knob that you turn in terms of how you provision the underlying compute resource. And that's the amount of memory that your function has that it can consume. Doesn't mean that it will absolutely consume that, but it gives you basically the headroom that you might need based on what it is that your function needs. And so today we support everything from 120 megabytes up to 1.5 gigabytes. Um, and so you've got quite a lot of capability inside of that. Now when you turn that knob for memory, you also proportionally are adjusting the amount of CPU and network that is allotted with that. Um, so one common performance tweaking uh, recommendation that we have is if you think that your function for some reason is executing slow, adding more memory does add more CPU. And so if you have a CPU intensive workload, it could seem maybe not to uh, not come to mind first about tweaking that knob, but it does again help you with performance. Uh, flexible use cases, so we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a moment. Synchronous, asynchronous, streaming models for how you invoke Lambda. And so quite, again, a lot of different capabilities for how you can actually put Lambda into an application stack. And then lastly, with a lot of, with every service that we have here at AWS, security is, is basically a top priority for how we build a product. So inside of Lambda, and we'll talk about this here in a moment as well, there's a number of different security capabilities that are ingrained and built into the product that basically help you uh, achieve, I think, a higher level of, of security potentially versus if you were doing this yourself and writing all the components inside of a traditional uh, server-based application. In terms of working with Lambda and building your functions, basically you can do what you've always done. So use any IDE or code editor, uh, whether it be VI or Emacs or Visual Studio or Eclipse or Notepad, um, whatever it is that you want to write code in, you can write Lambda functions in. Um, again, we've got a number of third-party plugins for uh, various different IDEs and editors that are out there. We consider monitoring and logging a kind of core capability inside of Lambda. So inside of your Lambda functions, anytime that you do anything that looks like a console.log or a print.f statement 
We're actually going to capture that text and put it into CloudWatch logs and make it available to you so you can digest it via that service. Um, or you could take that data from CloudWatch logs and pass it into, say, a Splunk or an Elk stack or into S3 or whatever it is that you might want to process that data. Same thing goes with metrics. So across Lambda, just like many other products here at AWS, we generate a number of different metrics around things like invocation count, uh, duration, errors, and a couple of other things that are there. So we're going to give you a lot of data and information about how your functions are performing uh, just right out of the box so that you having to add anything like an agent uh, in order to monitor or gather this information. From a programming model perspective, again, it's very similar to writing an application on any other compute platform. So we expose to you threads. You have the ability to kick off or fork other processes. You have access to temporary storage inside of the running environment. Um, while there are some restrictions in terms of what you can do with those things, uh, it still doesn't change the way that you think about building your application from an actual code level all that much. And then lastly, very important with Lambda, is it is a stateless compute service. So behind the scenes, what happens is we manage very, very large fleets of compute resources on the AWS Lambda team. Very, very, very big, large number of, of EC2 instances behind the scenes. When your function gets a request that comes into it, we basically look and say, OK, is this function uh, currently up and running, effectively warm on the infrastructure? If it is, then the request will go to that, that, that piece of compute capacity, execute your business logic, execute your code effectively, and then stop. And so you only pay for that time during that execution in hundreds of milliseconds worth of billing. Uh, if for some reason you didn't have a, a warmed piece of infrastructure that was set up for your function, then we go and basically allot resources to that, bootstrap your code, execute your function, and then return it. And so there's a, a number of things that you can get into about this, but one of the key things to keep in mind is that that compute resource that we create to execute your function does not stay around permanently. So unlike a traditional compute resource, again, whether it be virtual, physical, or even container-based, it's a stateless compute resource. There's no assurance that a subsequent request is going to have any affinity back to that resource. So it does change the programming model in that sense, and that you can't make use of any sort of localized uh, you know, cache ability of data. Um, there are some tricks with the temp space, but generally speaking, it's not necessarily a best practice. So again, in terms of pricing, Lambda is billed by the hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, you never pay for idle. So if your Lambda function is configured and up and, and exists but not doing anything, well, then you're not paying for anything. So a whole lot of benefit again to this. But then again, as requests come in, you pay just for the requests, just as they're executed based on the execution time of your function. From a development perspective, you can think about how in a in traditional environment, best practice is to have dev staging and prod. And if you were doing that type of a model with physical servers or virtual servers or containers, you're paying for you know, dev staging and obviously production. But in the case of Lambda and many of the service architectures that we have, you're paying for nothing of those resources to exist outside of when you're invoking and executing them. So again, very different dynamic from a, a cost model aligned with service architectures. And we're going to see, and both hear from Mickey here, how these cost savings you know, appear or show up for many of our customers. So when it comes to execution model, I talked about a service application has an event source, a function, and then that function's business logic. The execution model, or effectively the event invocation model, today there are three different ways that you can invoke a Lambda function. The first is a synchronous model. In this case, we give the example of using Amazon API Gateway, which we have a, a API that we're going to call, and we're expecting Lambda to come back and give us a response. And so that is a, a synchronous motion. We also support asynchronous models. So we see here the example of using S3 and SNS, where an object maybe is uploaded to an S3 bucket or a message is put into an SNS topic. That is going to then go and invoke a Lambda function either with that message's content or with the data where that object lives in S3, such that we can pull it down and process it in our Lambda function. Now, in those situations, you're expecting a response back from SNS or S3 to say that the message or the object was received. But you're typically not sitting around and waiting for then whatever it is that the Lambda function is going to do in any sort of synchronous model. So this is an asynchronous workflow. Lastly, stream-based. So in the case of stream-based, today we support this with DynamoDB and Kinesis, where you could potentially, in the case of uh, Amazon Kinesis, have a, a ton of data being ingested. We have customers that are doing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of requests per second in through Kinesis. Those will come in through what are called Kinesis shards. Those shards then uh, relate back to a Lambda function, which will be invoked. The Lambda function will pull in that information, do whatever it needs to do. 
So I've seen customers use this for ad tech use cases, for gathering things like log data, sensor data, and so forth. With DynamoDB, it actually, in this case, uses Kinesis streams uh, behind the scenes or under the hood, as it were, such that when you have updates, creates, or deletes to your DynamoDB table, it can take those uh, calls, pass them back into a stream, and then Lambda can process these. And these are good for effectively creating uh, more or less database triggers, for doing things like replication, for taking that data and maybe putting it into a data warehouse. There's all sorts of different things that you can do in near real time uh, with this model with Lambda. Now, there's actually a little over 20 services uh, today, as, as far as I know for today. We've obviously had a couple of announcements, so there may be a couple more that are out there, um, and there are probably going to be more throughout the rest of this week. But we've got data stores, again, development and management tools, endpoint services, uh, event or messaging services. So lots of different capabilities and lots of different things that you can do uh, using Lambda. So I mentioned before about how security is a super high priority for us here at AWS, considered our kind of first priority in the products that we build. It's something that's discussed from day one of planning a new product. Uh, inside of Lambda, there's a number of different capabilities that are built into it from a security perspective. At a very, very, very fine-grained security control. So you can control who has the ability to invoke a Lambda function, and then when that Lambda function is invoked, what it can do in terms of talking to other AWS services. And you can get very, very specific in IAM about what that looks like. You can also do things like with API Gateway, pass in credentials from third parties or from uh, your customers that have maybe authenticated with uh, API Gateway, such that you can assume those credentials, pass them into Lambda, and have that Lambda function do only what it needs to do based on what those credentials can allow. So we have a concept of uh, execution policies. Again, it defines what that function can access. We then have function policies, so who is allowed to actually execute that function. Um, and these can be used for cross-account as well. So Amazon API Gateway is another one of the products that exists inside of our serverless space, and they're kind of the key components that represent serverless here at AWS. Uh, API Gateway, much as the name might suggest, is an API Gateway. So when you are building an API, there's a lot of things that typically go into that that are fairly standard. Authentication and authorization, throttling, usage tiers, logging, maybe something along with doing you know, transforms or requests that come in, um, uh, things like DDoS protection, caching, all of these are things that as a developer building an API-based service, you often might think about building yourself if you weren't using an API gateway. And I pretty much 100% of the time recommend that if you're building anything that looks like an API, you should have some sort of API gateway and product in front of it. So Amazon API Gateway does all the things that I just mentioned. So it helps you with authentication, authorization, caching, DDoS protection, usage tiers, throttling, uh, in a number of different ways, and so it's a really very straightforward service where, again, you don't manage any of the servers. It's a completely managed, automatically scalable, high availability, pay only for what you use products. So it meets, again, the four key tenants that we have for serverless here at AWS. Another member of the serverless family is AWS Step Functions. So Step Functions is a serverless workflow management product. So while, why this is really interesting and important is that what we typically find is people start to decompose applications from a more monolithic application or a traditional kind of compute workload into Lambda is that you sometimes might think to yourself, well, how do I make Lambda functions call other Lambda functions? How do I handle parallelization? How do I handle decision trees? How do I handle retries and failure logic and, and things like that? So instead of you building that logic directly into your Lambda function, you can use step functions to actually take and offload all of this for you. So we see here an example of a fairly actually straightforward decision tree or workflow tree inside of step functions. Uh, we've got a function that has a choice. We have an execution function, then calls another one, which has basically to make a decision about which path it should take here. If it follows one of the other paths, at some point it does a parallel task. It waits for both of those to finish, has one more task, and then ends. And we can do all sorts of complicated business logic inside of this, again, without having to put this into our function code. And so what this means is that our Lambda functions can be basically just our business logic, the actual work that we need to do, and then our workflow logic can be brought up to step functions. So for many of our customers, we see their Lambda functions are in the tens of lines of code, whereas a traditional microservice might exist in the many hundreds to thousands of lines of code. Um, so I like to throw around the term nano services, which maybe is a little too far in, into the future of what we're seeing people do, but realistically it does represent how people are building Lambda-based applications. 
Amazon Lex, one of our AI services, this is a service that uh, can allow you to take speech and via using natural language understanding and automatic speech recognition, derive the text from the, uh, the, either the audio that's being spoken into it, the voice, or it can take textual-based conversations and pull it apart and derive meaning from that as well. And so this is a service used to build chatbots, again, whether they be audio-based or text-based, um, and actually one of the core services that powers Alexa behind the scenes. And so Lex uses Lambda for fulfillment of actions. So let's talk really briefly about what that means. So let's assume that I want to ask my chatbot to help me book a hotel. And so I'm going to say to it that I want to book a hotel in New York City. The automatic speech recognition inside of Lex is going to pull apart the individual words that are part of that. The natural language processing is going to see that I have intents around doing hotel booking in New York City. And so there's this intent and slot model. Um, basically, then, these utterances we can get passed into Lambda, and then Lambda has the ability to say, you know what, we need a little bit more information about this. So we know New York City, but let me go ahead and ask what uh, time it is or what day I want to check in. So again, Lambda can help handle business logic. It can also be the thing that talks to your database to create the booking or talk to another API service. And then basically, Lex can then reply back out through potentially Amazon Polly, a verbal response. And Polly today supports a couple different uh, languages and, and voices. Uh, combining Lambda and Amazon Kinesis is another really popular uh, application architecture model for, a, uh, for service applications. So what you can do here with Kinesis, and there's a couple different components to Kinesis today. You have Kinesis Streams, Kinesis Firehose, Kinesis Analytics, and actually Lambda can interface with all of those. But primarily what we're seeing customers do is ingesting data, and then they need to do some sort of near, near real-time compute against that data. And so in this case, we see kind of a, an architecture where we have a Kinesis Stream coming in, that data is then being processed by Lambda. One of my Lambda functions is going to take that data and put it in S3. The other one's going to maybe process that data and pull out some metadata about something, put it into Dynamo, and maybe put some data into CloudWatch logs. Maybe I'm processing an event stream from one of my own products. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that you can do in this space. And this is, again, one of the larger use cases for serverless applications today. One example of this actually comes from Bustle. So Bustle.com is a news and entertainment and lifestyle and fashion website for women. Uh, this da this uh, data might be a little dated at this point, but at the time of the use case that they did with us, they had 52 million monthly users, 100 million uh, events daily. And by moving from a traditional compute environment to serverless, they were able to save 84% on what it was costing them to run their technology. And in this case, now they have zero servers that they manage, control, update, patch, et cetera, uh, some zero operating system, and automatic scaling built in. No more needing to tweak or tune auto scaling rules or needing to think about uh, any of the other things that would typically go into managing this from a traditional compute environment. So one architecture that they've shared is how they handle event streaming. So this here is a fairly sophisticated event streaming pipeline where they're taking in data coming from their customers, either over mobile device or over traditional you know, compute-based browsers, into an API gateway, into a Lambda backend. That's then going into Amazon Kinesis, where the data is passed into both another Lambda function as well as directly into S3. The one Lambda function is taking the data that's coming in, putting data then into Elasticsearch, into CloudWatch, into mobile analytics, um, into Redis. The data that's in S3 is then made available to Redshift, and then it can be looked at via our BI tool, Amazon QuickSight. So outside of Redshift, which is a, a largely almost zero administration managed data warehouse, and outside of Elasticsearch, which is another managed service for them, they really don't have much in the way of servers that they're managing here. Again, that entire ingest pipeline will scale up automatically for them, have high availability, and have a high level of security, basically building a very fine grain uh, lockdown and tighten up this, uh, the permissions for these services. Another example for this here is in a distributed computing in the research space. In the University of California, Berkeley, uh, they created an open source tool called Pyren. And so Pyren is meant for kind of massive, large-scale distributed computation. And they did just a couple of basic tests where they were able to show really incredible results using Lambda, where they were running uh, a little over 2,800 simultaneous Lambda functions, processing between 60 and 80 gigabytes per second. Uh, which is a lot of processing to do in near real time for a very, very, very low cost. And that was one of the other key takeaways from this. Uh, Square Enix, the company behind the Dragon Quest games, moved from a traditional compute-based model for processing images 
which used to take them way, way longer than it did once they moved to Lambda. Uh, in fact, it used to take them hours. It moved down to 10 seconds or so per image at one-tenth of the cost, uh, saving them, again, a whole lot of money here, right? Bringing something in at one-twentieth the cost is pretty drastic savings for a workload. Home24, which is a European uh, online shopping market for uh, home goods of all sorts of different types, uh, moved from having a traditional compute-based environment to doing a bunch of workloads on Lambda as well. They actually make heavy usage here of step functions as part of a uh, data aggregation and ingest to help uh, with their product. And so in this case, the cost savings was about 99%. They're able to much more quickly stand up these ETL pipelines. And then they have increased resilience that they've seen as part of this. So they're seeing fewer downtime, uh, or smaller limits of downtime or issues as part of this move to serverless. So lastly here, one of the other questions that we get is, can I build uh, applications using serverless that have to meet certain accreditation or compliance standards? And the answer is yes. So across most of the services that fall into our serverless stack, they are now, as of about September, covered under both uh, HIPAA and PCI. So whether you're building a financial application or a healthcare application, you can start looking at doing this with serverless as well. So I'm gonna hand it over here to Nikki to talk a little bit more about what Capital One has done as part of their journey to serverless. Thank you, Nikki. All right, thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikki Joshi. I'm a director of software engineering at Capital One, and I'm here to share our experiences about migrating one of our web applications to a serverless architecture. As many of you may know, Capital One is a top 10 US bank with assets in the tune of 350 billion US dollars. As many of you may not know, is that Capital One is a technical institution on the cutting edge of technology. We are leading the pack in the move to public cloud, and AWS is a strategic partner in this process. According to Alexa.com, our primary website, CapitalOne.com, is a top 100 US site in terms of web traffic. The story I'm gonna to share today is about our experiences of migrating our Capital One auto finance marketing website to a serverless architecture. The story for us begins in 2015. 2015 is when we started to migrate our systems to AWS. For a Capital One auto finance website, we broke the migration into two phases. The first phase went live in August of 2016, and we completed a serverless migration to in April of this year. Before starting the migration, we took a step back and looked at the holistic requirements of a marketing site. Basically, we had to migrate the full functionality of the site, as well as have the ability for advanced functionalities like A-B testing and multivariate testing. We are a financial institution, so security was obviously critical for us. We had to be set up in a resilient, active, active manner. This is a marketing site, so obviously the response time of the site had to be very low, and we had to be SEO friendly as well. We had to have the ability for continuous deployments and be set up in a low maintenance mode. And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So there were a lot of existing tools and processes in the organization that we wanted to reuse, primarily around logging, monitoring, and deployments. This is where we started from. So this architecture is not very different than what many enterprises have even today for the web application stacks. While there are many challenges with this architecture, there are a few of them that were highly limiting for us. The first was that since this is an enterprise-wide common deployment, there was one release calendar that dictated our release cycle. This meant that sometimes our features had to be developed months in advance before we could release them to production. Obviously, that's not optimal for a marketing site in this day and age. In addition to that, this is a highly tightly coupled architecture. There were times when there were issues in one part of the application that would cause issues in an unrelated part of the application, which is obviously unacceptable. 
So with that, we started a serverless migration. And in our phase one, we achieved two objectives. The first was to move off an on-premises data center and moved to AWS, as well as have a serverless content strategy in place. This is the architecture that we landed for our serverless content. For our application architecture, we chose uh, a single page application framework, and we use Angular for that. As many of you know, a single page application is served over multiple HTTP requests. The first HTTP request loads the application in the browser, and then subsequent API calls are made to load the content and the functionality of the application. We created a pre-rendered bundle of the Angular app and stored that in the S3 bucket, and we enabled web hosting on the S3 bucket as well. This content that was deployed in the S3 bucket in the East region was also replicated to an S3 bucket in the West region. In front of the S3 buckets, we leveraged Amazon CloudFront for hosting our SSL certificate for SSL termination. In front of CloudFront, we leveraged Route 53, which gives us a resilient active-active setup. In addition to that, we're able to use a non-AWS component like Akamai at the edge for content caching. To summarize, I want to call out three points in this architecture. The first, by leveraging the S3 buckets, we were able to eliminate the need for any EC2 instances. Secondly, by leveraging CloudFront and Route 53, we were able to meet our security and resiliency requirements. And finally, we were able to continue our investment in Akamai and leverage that investment and have the ability for content caching at the edge. While our destination state was to go fully serverless, we ran into certain issues with the ability for us to use Lambda functions in production in 2016. As a result of that, we had to come up with an interim EC2-based architecture. For that, we used a cluster of EC2 instances running Apache, which acted as a web application firewall. The EC2 instances in the back are running Tomcat, running our application logic. Both EC2 instances are fronted with load balancers. This setup is then replicated in, across three availability zones in the East region. The entire setup is then replicated in the West region as well. And then we leverage Route 53 in the front of that for a resilient active-active setup. For a simple, ap simple application like we had, this infrastructure definitely seemed to be a little bit of an overkill. So as we, I'm going to talk about our complete serverless migration in phase two, I'll address about how we migrated this over to Lambda functions. Wrapping up our phase one migration, this is the simple CI-CD pipeline that we created for content. We stored our application templates in GitHub. We stored our content in a content management system. We leverage an EC2 build server, which pulls the templates from GitHub, pulls the content from CMS, packages them together, and then utilizes the AWS CLI to push this content package bundle into an S3 bucket. As a result of this, we were able to achieve two things. First of all, we got a very responsive response time for our website. And this resulted in our Angular application being SEO friendly as well. Coming to our serverless migration phase two, this is where we went full serverless. We moved our APIs over to a Lambda functions, and we created a CI CD process for our APIs as well. This is the architecture that we landed on for our move to serverless APIs. The heart of this is obviously the Lambda function in the front, which is running our application logic. That Lambda function is logging to CloudWatch. Since our target destination state in the, our enterprise is Splunk, we needed to find a way to get the logs from CloudWatch into Splunk. For that, we were able to use another Lambda function that was triggered with the logs that were in, ingested in the CloudWatch and put into Splunk. 
You may notice something that's fronting the Lambda function called the Capital One Enterprise Gateway. Think of that as something very similar to the AWS API Gateway that Chris referenced a little bit earlier in his slides. Since Capital One had an Enterprise Gateway that was performing functionally similar to what we have for the AWS API Gateway, we chose to leverage the Enterprise Gateway that we already had. This setup was then created in the East region, replicated over to the West region as well. And then we leveraged Route 53 again for a resilient active-active setup. To summarize two points on this architecture, by leveraging Lambda functions, we were able to get rid of our EC2 instances completely. And we were still able to leverage non-AWS components that the enterprise already had investment in, like Splunk and the Enterprise Gateway, for us to continue and go fully serverless. This is the CI CD pipeline that we built for Lambda Functions. We store our Lambda Function code in GitHub. Jenkins is our build tool of choice in the enterprise. On code commits to GitHub, there's a build job that gets triggered in Jenkins, which pulls the code, leverages the AWS CLI, and creates a deployment bundle in the S3 bucket. Leveraging the AWS CLI commands like Lambda create and Lambda update, we were able to create and update our Lambda functions accordingly. A couple of other options that we looked at was the serverless application model and the serverless framework. But for what we needed for application was fairly simple. And hence, we chose to go with a very simple architecture like this. Coming to the benefits of serverless, we, as a result of the migration, we ended up with a very simple architecture. Basically, it runs itself, and it scales itself. One of the biggest benefits that we have is we no longer have to worry about AMI rehydrations. And believe me, for us, that's something that's keeping our compliance and operations teams extremely happy. Finally, coming to the cost savings, as a result of this migration, we conservatively have been able to save about $50,000 a year by leveraging S3 web hosting and by leveraging Lambda functions, we've been able to eliminate about 20 EC2 instances, ELBs, and EBS volumes from our infrastructure. Not to mention the countless number of hours that we have saved in terms of operations as well. Coming over to lessons learned, a migration can be a journey, so would recommend a plan accordingly. When you're starting the migration, Start small. Start with some of the easier pieces of your system, and then go on to some of the more complex pieces. As we've demonstrated, there's no one size fits all with serverless architecture. You can go as much serverless as you want, or as little serverless as you want. Reuse existing tools and processes that you may already have. You don't want to reinvent the wheel for something like a system migration, if possible. And finally, get stakeholder buy-in early in the process. There's a lot of new learnings here, but your enterprise architects, your security teams, operation teams, compliance teams will want to know about your migration steps, and will be very happy to be a part of this process as well. So that wraps up my piece of the presentation, and I'd like to hand it back over to Chris to wrap up our presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah. I don't mean to call him out, but this is Nikki's first time presenting at reInvent, and I think he just did a really incredible job and spoke really well. Thank you. So, thank you. Thanks, Chris. So kind of, kind of in summarization here, really great story from Capital One where they were able to reuse some of the process and technology they had used previously, able to shift and migrate an on-prem solution up through the AWS cloud using traditional compute resources, and then eventually moving to a very simplistic serverless application architecture. Some takeaways if you're, you're new to serverless here today, right? So the four kind of key things that we uh, consider as guiding rules for serverless here at AWS. 
no servers to manage or provision, uh, no cost for idle, high availability, and automatic scalability built into it. The architecture that Nikki just talked about uh, is able to leverage all four of those benefits, in helping out their organization again, save money, save time, achieve higher resiliency and scalability with less work and effort. Lambda and many of the other AWS uh, serverless applications and services that we have are integrated really deeply across the stack. And if you come to any of the other serverless track sessions this week, or actually probably in a lot of the tracks that you'll see this week, you'll see Lambda and some of the rest of these services pop up as, again, either core components or helper solutions in terms of what it is that you might be doing. And so you'd want to look at, again, some of these services here that today have the ability to invoke Lambda in you know, coordination with some of the rest of these services. And then lastly, from a use case perspective, we've talked about just kind of a couple of the big bucketed ones here today. Web applications, backends, data processing, chatbots, Amazon Alexa, and then IT automation. But don't think of these six buckets as being fairly constrained. There's a lot of things that fits into them. And so think about your own architecture. Think about the various application pools and tiers that you run. Think about the various you know, one-off compute resources that you might have and think about how you might be able to think about moving them to a solution based on AWS Lambda. A lot of what uh, I've talked about here, at least today, can be found on our service landing page at aws.amazon.com slash serverless. We have reference guides, getting started guides, all of our documentation, links to our compute blog, which gets updated uh, sometimes multiple times a week with interesting content, uh, and all sorts of other things like partner solutions as well. So check, check that out. Again, my name's Chris Munns. I'm Senior Developer Advocate for Serverless at AWS. You can find me at munns at amazon.com or at Chris Munns on Twitter. Uh, please uh, give us feedback on this talk. We'd love to know what we can do better next time, what you'd like to see and hear from us in the future. Again, this is uh, CMP 211. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great rest of your week here at reInvent.